So uh, several people still had some problems because they might not have been set up on Canvas properly. Uh, I did have the ESS staff send out an email to everybody informing of them of that process. Uh, of course, I couldn't send this out because uh, I don't have access to the uh, enrollment system itself. Uh, so hopefully everybody got that email. If not, I want to make sure that you're aware of this resor uh, resources for Scott campus. Uh, this has been posted on Piazza and it should have been sent out through the email. Uh, in particular, you'll want to draw your attention to the Husker Maverick and email addresses uh, and how to get access to both of those. And then finally, also the UNL Canvas instructions. So there's a PDF you can download uh, to claim your account uh, to get into Canvas. And once you're in Canvas, again, it should look something like this. Uh, the, the, this is the uh, Canvas course for this, uh, uh, for, for this course. Um, another thing I want to draw your attention to is uh, in the handouts, it might be referring to the main section that I usually do in the fall. Uh, in particular, if you go to the resources, sorry, uh, resources, you'll want to follow everything in Canvas, not the handouts. For example, the grader, don't go to the wrong class. Go to the, go, go make sure that you're going to this class, which is uh, the URL is something like e C hyphen ECEN 1940, 1940, yeah, 1940, right? All right. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, if you have not already, ex uh, you know, uh, accept, uh, you need to accept those invites that were sent out, but also you need to make sure that you claim your CSE account. And you can do that by going to cse.unl.edu slash claim. It'll redirect you here. Uh, and then you provide it your Huskers email. Uh, I know at least one person is still having a problem with this, but it, uh, it has, uh, how many people have claimed their CSE account through this process? Okay, so it's at least working for the majority of you. All right. So if you're, not, if you're still having problems, make sure that you're contacting me. And again, uh, hopefully, you're, if you're not here today, hopefully you are finding this live stream to contact me. All right. All right. So get rid of all that stuff. Get rid of that, that. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce you to the basics of, well, first of all, a computer program to begin with, but in the, con in the specific context of C. The way that we're gonna do that is we're just gonna get started. We're just going to go ahead and write our first program here. Uh, we already wrote one program, right? The Hello World program. All it did was print out Hello World. I want a little bit more of a substantive, and now this is still very, very simple, but I want a little bit more of a substantive program here. So we're actually going to do something. We're going to convert, uh, we're gonna ask the user for a certain amount of ki mass, kilograms, and then we're going to output the conversion to pounds. Uh, and just in case you didn't have it off the top of your head, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. Right? So if I had 10 kilograms, then of course that would be 22.0 whatever, whatever, whatever uh, pounds. Right? If I had 10.5, pull out your calculators and figure out what that is. We're going to be doing that as a program here. Now, let's outline the basics here. What we're gonna do is we need a basic programming program framework. Uh, just like we had last time, we brought in some external libraries because we didn't want to start from scratch. We documented what our program was about. We had a main function because that's where every program begins. But we're also going to need basic I.O. I.O. Right? being input output. We're going to be prompting, prompt the user for some input. Right? Read the input. We're going to store the input. Right? We're going to read it and ask him for 10 kilograms. Uh, we're going to convert, convert the values. All right, this is just basically math. Uh, and then we're going to output the results. Now, if you've done any programming up to now, uh, then this, is, this will be, it seems so basic that, well, of course, that's step one, step two, step three. Uh, but if you're completely new, or even if you're, you know, uh, uh, an advanced user or whatever, you still go through this process with every single program you write. Uh, at the be very beginning, you write it out on a piece of paper, or you write it out on, uh, on uh, electronically like this, or you go up and you call, do what we call whiteboarding, right? You outline what you're about to do. You do this when you write a paper. You write an outline, and then you go back and you fill it in. All right, uh, programs are no different than English. Uh, writing, writing in C code, writing in any other code is no different than writing in a, uh, just a regular language. It's just different syntax and a different purpose. So once we've got our outline here, we've identified some major aspects that we need to actually implement into our program. 
Even if you're advanced, you still go through this process. It's just that you go through it in your head and you go through it a lot quicker, omitting a lot of the details, right? All right, so let's start at the top here. What, first of all, I need to create a new file. So if you're in the CS50 IDE, you can go ahead and go with new, uh, new file. Uh, and I'll call this uh, convert.c, right? Usually we wanna name the program or the source file uh, you know, appropriately. Uh, I could have named this, what is it, uh, kilograms to pounds or something like that. That would be even more specific. I'll just go ahead and, uh, and name it convert here, okay? Step one, at the very top, we're gonna wanna document what we're doing. In fact, documentation helps you do that kind of outline. What am I doing again? I'm writing a program to convert from kilograms into my uh, pounds, right? So I'm going to doc uh, document that using doc style comments here. Uh, I'm going to give myself, first of all, the author, which is me. I'm going to give myself the date, 2022, 01, 26 is the date, right? And then the purpose. Uh, this program converts uh, kilograms to pounds, right? Now, in general, abbreviations in code are bad. Abbreviations in regular old text, uh, I don't know. It, 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 half, six of one, half a dozen of another. If I just write LBS, everybody understands what that is? Pretty much universal. Uh, but what if you go over, I don't, I don't know, to Europe? They don't use pounds at all, right? Uh, they would need some context there. So let's go ahead and write it out instead. Prefer to write out, I mean, it, it doesn't, we're not paying by the character or anything, right? Don't abbreviate things if you don't have to. Clarity is way more important than brevity, especially when it comes to code, right? And then I'm going to end this comment here with a slash. So that's my first doc style comment here, slash, star, star, and then this, uh, it auto-generated these uh, vertical uh, stars for me so that it, it gives it a nice ASCII text formatting. It will all ended with this slash right here. This is, this is documentation, I'm calling this documentation, but actually what it is is just a comment. And that's our first major basic item of a program. Right? So comments. Comments are human readable uh, messages embedded in code. They are ignored by the compiler, right? In fact, most compilers will just throw them away in, immediately. In fact, I think the preprocessor does in this case. Um, it, it, it's not actual code that's read. It, it is not written for the machine. It is written for other humans to read. So clarity is absolutely essential, right? Uh, you can have, uh, in C, you can have single line comments. And the syntax for doing that is simply just slash slash, right? Now, is that a backslash or a forward slash? Do you remember? That's a forward slash because the guy is leaning forward, right? When you look left to right. Let me give myself some padding here, right? Uh, that begins with a slash slash and everything after on the same line is ignored. Right? It's a comment. You have multi-line comments. So here I'll go into code mode entirely, and ah, got to get rid of some errors on my side here. Uh, anyway, it starts with a uh, slash star, and then you can write whatever you want. Everything in between the star, uh, slash star and the closing star slash is ignored. All right, so I'll go ahead and do it like this. Now it's always best to align things and get into a good habit of aligning things. You'll note here that there's not a vertical uh, a bunch of stars. The stars would, would be part of the comment and they'd be ignored as well. Uh, it didn't do it this way because, it didn't do that for me in this one because it's not an IDE. It's not an integrated development environment. Uh, but whatever you put between those two things is completely ignored, right? Uh, and finally, you have doc style comments, doc style comments. It's just a multi-line comment with an extra star and a vertically aligned star. So it's a, just, just a uh, regular, regular multi-line comment with an extra star and uh, vertical formatting stars. All right. You use it for each major program or major function you write. 
uh, in case you need, uh, you have need to document what the expectations of this function are. Uh, for my input to this function, I expect it to be kilograms, right? If they gave me something like, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, fluid ounces or something like that, right? I would definitely get an answer. It's just not going to be a conversion that makes sense because uh, they're not following what my expectations are. Okay. Uh, comments. The purpose of comments, especially documentation, is in uh, is intended to tell the user, that is other programmers, and you, the why and the how, not the what. So let me explain what I mean by that. Why are you doing this? I'm doing this because I'm writing a program because I want to convert kilograms to pounds. Right? How is this being done? Well, I'm going to be reading information from the user and I'm going to be outputting that stuff. Not the what, right? So what I mean by that was when we eventually get into this, uh, this full program, you'll see that I'm not going to document every single damn line of code. That is way overkill. You don't do that. You only document major portions. Right? Now, for demonstration purposes, I will be doing that. But at the end, I'll show you, no, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. Right? Document, uh, code should be self-documenting. If I have a, um, a line that says print hello world, I don't need above it, this line prints hello world. Right? That line of code is completely self-documenting. Right? Don't put that kind of documentation in. Don't put those kind of comments in. But the why, uh, I'm, co I'm com computing the, uh, I don't know, I'm computing the square root based on a linear interpolation method uh, based on a Taylor series. And this is why, because I have some convergence property that I want. Right? That's perfect documentation. Right? Uh, because it, it's, it's arcane, it's not well understood. You can link to external resources explaining more about the, the algorithm that you're using. Uh, but uh, it, that's certainly not going to be completely apparent just by looking at the code itself. Right? Uh, again, code should be self-documenting. Right? Uh, code should tell you the what. Okay. All right. Next step. Again, I don't want to start from scratch. I don't want to have to write my own code to read from the user and to print stuff. So I'm going to bring in a couple of libraries. First of all, I'm going to bring in the standard library, stdlib. Just do it, right? Now, there are some, uh, uh, like 99 times out of 100, the, uh, the standard library is so standard that the compiler will bring it in automatically. It's that one time out of 100 that it fails to, and oh, you don't have a basic thing like what an integer is, right? Or uh, that's going a little bit far, but uh, you definitely want to bring in the standard library as best practice. You also probably want to bring in the standard STDIO library, right? If you're doing math stuff, what do you think you want to bring in? The math library, right? Now we're not we're, now. Basic math, like multiplication, division, right? those basic operators are built into the language. You don't need the math library for that. If you're doing sine, cosine, square root, that kind of stuff, then yeah, you do need to bring in the math library. Later on, when we operate on strings, if we've got one string that says hello and we want to concatenate it to another string that says goodbye, right? then you would need to bring in the string library. Right? But we don't need that stuff just yet. I'm just giving you a preview of some other libraries that you might be using later on, okay? Uh, and one more thing. What I want to do is I want to define, a, it's kind of like a constant, this is called a macro. I want to define how many, uh, what is it? How many kilograms, or how many pounds, I should say, are in a kilogram, right? Because is that going to change? No, well, it changes in the presence of gravity, right? Uh, but we're talking about here on Earth, right? Uh, uh, the one kilogram won't change because that's 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 defined with respect to Earth's gravity, uh, whatever that whatever that is. But anyway, uh, so what would I write this as? Kilograms per uh, pound, and I'll put that number there. All right. I'll get into the syntax here specifically in a second, but. Read that out loud to me. KGS. Is that, if I just wrote KGS by itself, would you immediately say that that's kilograms? Probably, okay, probably not, maybe not. So 
We're, again, we're not paying by the uh, character here. We're not getting paid by the character either. So kilogram, kilos per pound, maybe? Uh, that would be a much more sensible uh, abbreviation. But if you don't want to abbreviate at all, kilograms per pound. There we go. Or is it pounds per kilogram? Which is it? Should, uh, that, uh, one kilogram is equal to 2.2 pounds. So therefore, what's the better name? Pounds per kilogram. All right, there we go. All right. You gotta parse that out. So there's an old joke that uh, in computer science, there are only two diff difficult things, cash invalidation and naming things. All right, so you'll sit there and you'll argue <laughs> in your own head and maybe with a partner or something, we should call this function this. We should call this variable that, right? And you get bogged down into the minutia of, 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 of that argument of what we should name this stuff, right? Just name it what it says, right? What it says on the tin. So what these were are preprocessor directives. So let's come back over here and start talking about preprocessor directives. Right. Uh, these are commands, commands, or uh, directives or macros uh, that are uh, executed before the compiler compiles your code. So what is a macro? Maybe a directive, command, that's, those are generic terms, but macro is a very specific term. People who have a lot of Excel experience, what is a macro? Oh, no? All right, so it's a re something that you can record. Take, uh, take the element in this cell and copy it to this cell, add it to that cell, and then put the result over here in this cell, right? That one, two, three, four step process, you can record that process. And then, so you don't have to do it all the time. Click, 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 right? You, what you can do is you can put that into one command and re-execute that command over and over. Uh, that's basically what this macro is doing. There are two types that we just looked at. The include, oops, sorry, include uh, brings in external or standard libraries. Right? It actually includes the header file. Right? It does a copy paste, right? When we get to header files and making our own header files and modular programming later on, we'll understand that a little bit better. For now, just understand that you're gonna bring in some libraries, in particular, the standard input output library and the standard library itself. The second one that we looked at was define, right? Define defines a, uh, an alias that can be used to replace magic numbers. Right. So let me go back over here. I don't want that. There we go. Let me go back over here. And if I just wrote down the number 2.204 blah blah blah, would that you immediately understand what that was? Right. In no, in no, without any context whatsoever. There are some numbers that that is true. If I say 3.14159, what am I referring to? Pi, right? That's because you immediately understand what it is. If I said 2.71, I don't remember the rest of it, what would you think I'm talking about? E. E, exactly. Right? There are some numbers that are universal, at least to maybe engineers, people with a mathematics background. If you asked a person on the street, maybe not. Uh, certain, but however, you'll get to a point where 2.20, what's that? Right? And so if you, but if you do weights and measures a lot and have to convert a lot of terrible English uh, metrics down to, uh, to the sensible uh, metric system, uh, then, you, then you might know it off the top of your head, but you're not exactly sure. If you saw this in a program, it would be called a magic number. Where the hell did that come from, right? Whereas if you used this alias of pounds per kilogram instead, instead of this magic mysterious number, then you completely understand what's going on. Uh, this is a value, this is a, an alias of how many pounds there are in a kilogram, right? What the preprocessor does is later on in my program, if I use this word, the, this word right here, if I use that word, the preprocessor goes through and finds every instance of that word and does a cut and paste. It takes this thing and, cut, and cuts, uh, you know, copies it and replaces the, these words with that value. So that in your program, you can keep that plain old English text there 
without having to worry about that magic number. The compiler, or the preprocessor directive, I should say, will take care of replacing it for you. It's kind of like having a constant, okay? but it's not exactly a constant. So it has several advantages. The first advantage is that you can use plain, uh, plain aliases, that is English, to, uh, as placeholders for magic numbers. The other advantage is, what if you want it to be more accurate? I only went out to one, two, three, six digits, right? What if I wanted to go out to seven digits? Or ah, I don't need that much accuracy. I'll go, only go to one digit or something like that. If you're using that in 50 different places in your program, what do you have to do? You have to go in and change it in 50 different places. Whereas if you use this macro, if you use this define, you only have to change it in one place and it's automatically changed everywhere else, right? So it relieves you of the need of making changes. One cha only one change <coughs> affects <coughs> all instances. Awesome. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, all right, questions so far? Okay. Give myself a, a second to... Uh, <coughs> Something got in my throat, I don't know. Uh, anyway, all right, what's next? <coughs> next is we're going to create a main function. So int main int argc char argv, right? return zero. Again, the main function is your beginning, the beginning point of any program. Uh, the rest of the syntax you can ignore for now. We'll get, to, get into it later on. These are command line arguments. This is an integer, it's returning a, a zero error code indicating no error. We'll talk about that at various points in the, uh, uh, in the uh, course. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and just start typing here. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and start typing like this. There we go. <coughs> All right. So what is the main, the main function? Uh, let's see, there we go. Let me go ahead and main function, there we go. I'm just going to go ahead and copy paste this. Again, for now, argc, argv, those are just magic, right? We'll talk about command line arguments later on. Uh, we're going to have some punctuation here, right? Uh, in, in particular, we're, uh, like, like plain old English, if you've got a sentence, a declarative sentence or whatever, uh, or a command sentence or something like this, go to the store and buy some more pop or something, right? What ends the sentence? A period, right? So we need a way to end every executable statement. Every executable statement in C is ended with not a period, because a period has a different meaning, uh, but a semicolon. Right. So the semicolon is the you know, dot and then uh, uh, comma, right? It's the semicolon. Um, blocks of code are denoted using opening and closing curly brackets. So opening and dot, dot, dot. You put code inside of there, and that's one unit, right? So what is the analogy? Uh, I did it right here to enclose main. Main, the code in main begins here, and it ends here. Anything inside of those brackets is what gets executed. This is an executable statement. It's the last one that we'll be writing, and it is ended by a semicolon. So periods and sentences, semicolons and commands, what are, what is the analog here in plain old English of these blocks of code where I've got these curly brackets? Paragraphs. So, paragraphs, exactly. If I've got sentence, 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 right, all collected to form an idea, and if I've got command, 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 all collected to form one logical unit of code, it's basically a paragraph, right? And so if you've got paragraphs within paragraphs within paragraphs, or different paragraphs over here that you can refer to, right? Uh, those are gonna be functions, or these are gonna be conditions and, uh, and uh, subroutines and stuff like, and uh, loops and stuff like that, okay? Uh, just, like you can, uh, just like you can have an outline to a plain old English paper or something. Here's the main idea, here's a sub idea, sub idea, sub idea, second main idea, sub idea, sub sub idea, right? And in each, each uh, particular one, what do you do with that, uh, with that outline? Bullet point, and then to indicate that these are all the sub-ideas, what do you do? You indent. And so I've indented here as well, right? 
So writing good code is just like writing good English, in particular, outlines. Okay. So indentation, or in general, white space is ignored by the language, but is essential for good style. Right. In particular, you should indent each uh, code block. Right? Uh, you should have both. Uh, you should have good both uh, good you should have good vertical and horizontal space right? uh, a lot of people get into the bad habit of oh this is like in writing English and if I have to write a five page essay what are you going to do double space it so that you really only have to write a two and a half page essay right well don't do that with code vertical light white space like that just tends to make your code long now, if you do have chunks of code, here's the first chunk of code, here's the major second chunk of code, here's the thir third chunk of code, yeah, go ahead and separate those by blank lines so, so that you can separate those ideas. But don't just go willy-nilly and make line, space, blank line, line, blank line, line, blank line. That's a bad style. Right? Don't get into that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start outlining this. I'm going to read, or prompt, I should say, prompt, the user for some input. And note here, this is a single line comment, slash, slash. Uh, read the input from the user. Right? Compute the uh, conversion. Right? And then output the result. Those are four, of, uh, four ideas that I identified with this, uh, uh, this outline up here. Okay. So we're going to go through and do each one of these separately. Right. Now, these are comments for demonstration purposes. At the end, and, and it, it is a good idea, when you're outlining your program, go ahead and do something like this. Step one, I'm going to have to do this. In fact, you can put in you know, step one, step two, step three, just so that you know where you are and where you're going. But at the end of the day, when you turn it in, these, co these kind of comments should not be here. Right. And we'll see the, uh, why after we've completed this program. So I need to prompt the user for some input. Well, yesterday, or Monday, we printed out Hello World. Today, I will be printing out a prompt. Please, and we'll be nice about it, please enter a number of kilograms. Right. There we go. And it's just a print statement. Please enter the number of kilograms. Okay. Now I'm going to read the input from the user. So. We've only done output so far. We're printing to the standard output. To read input the opposite direction, we need to scan F, scan formatted. Right? And there, there's going to be some uh, uh, formatting here. Don't worry about it just yet. Uh, and foo, question mark, there we go. All right, this is not real C code yet. Okay. So let's parse this line as we go along here. In fact, here. I'm just going to show it to you immediately here. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it like this for a second. So I'm going to scan the user, uh, user input. In other words, the standard input is the keyboard. Somebody can sit here and mash the keyboard to read the input. Okay. Uh, the percent %LF is what's called a placeholder. That placeholder is a special is a, is a special designation that I'm going to be reading in a floating point number. If I were expecting the user to enter in a uh, an integer instead, a whole number, I would use D. If I were expecting the user to enter in some sort of character, then it would be C. Right? We'll get to the details here uh, later on when I, when I actually write this up in the notes. Otherwise, what we're going to be reading in from the user is a fractional value. Because I do want to, to allow them to say, uh, give me uh, 10.5 kilograms. Right? Uh, if I restrict it to only integers, right, then that wouldn't be very flexible, right? Uh, well, what is 10.5 kilograms in pounds, right? Uh, so I'm going to read it in as a floating point number, all right? This thing here is where I put the result. If I mash the keyboard and sit and say 10.5, enter, then 10.5 is going to be converted into a number representing 10.5 and put into that variable. In other words, we need a, a variable first, right? So I'm going to come back up here and revise my outline, declare uh, your, uh, your variables, right. dot, dot, dot. So how many variables do you think we should have here? Certainly one to read in the user input, right? 
So I'm going to make that what's called a double. Right? I'll talk about doubles, integers, and, uh, and uh, other types here in a second. What should I call that variable? Here it was just a placeholder, foo. You'll find this, this all over the place in computer science. We just use foo bar baz as placeholders. Uh, and foo bar, you can look that up and understand what that is. It's spelled differently, though. Right? Right. Engineers should know what that is, right? F-U-B-A-R? All right, look it up yourself. <laughs> it's what happens when an en uh, some, some uh, catastrophic engineering failure. Right? Uh, all right, so I'm not going to call it foo. What should I call it? If it's storing, what is it storing? It's storing, I asked for kilograms, so should I call it K? Probably not, right? K, that, that's, that could mean a lot of things. Isn't that a, isn't K, uh, well, it could be kilometers, right? It could be any kilotons, it could be a kilobytes, it could be anything with a kilo in front of it. Uh, it could be also be, I think it's also used in different contexts for different things. All right, how about kilograms, KGS? That's an abbreviation. You might, uh, you, some of you shook your head already and said, in, without any context, you don't know what K KG, KGS is. Right? So kilos, that's fine. Kil kilograms is probably even better. Right? So I've got one variable here to represent kilograms. Do I need any other variables? Kilograms, and I'm going to convert to what? Pounds. Ah, so some more punctuation here. If you were writing an English paper and you had a list of things, how would you delimit that list? I would like cake and ice uh, cake, ice cream and cookies. Right? What goes in between each one of those things? A comma. Likewise here, if you've got a list of things in code, you can generally use a comma. Right? So I've got these two variables. Their types are doubles. So let's come back over here and understand what we've done so far. All right. Uh, let's see. So, input, output. Right? So, output is done by printf, right? a function called, a function called printf. Input is done by a function called scanf. Right? Uh, both of these are standard input, uh, outputs, output and input. Right? Uh, the standard output is your console. Right? The standard, standard input is your keyboard. Right? Uh, now you'll find with command line programs this, that, that is the standard input. Right? Uh, we're not talking about uh, you know, the consumer facing stuff where you've got a phone application and your input is actually a finger. Right? That's not the standard input. Uh, we're not talking about ma uh, graphical user interface programs where you've got a mouse or a trackpad or a mouse pa or, or a finger pad or whatever, whatever other in or a connect or something like that. Any any sort of device input device. We're talking about the keyboard when it comes to uh, standard input. Okay. Uh, placeholders are used for different variables. To understand that, though, we need to talk about variables first. All right. All right so. First of all, C is a statically typed language. Do not worry about the details of what that actually means. Just understand the implications of what it means. Basically, you must declare a variable and its type before you can use it. Right? To declare a variable, you provide a keyword of its type and then its name or identifier. Right. The identifier is its technical term. We're just going to call it the name. Okay. What are the types that we're going to be dealing with? Well, first of all, an int. Int is short for integer, integers. That is whole numbers, whole numbers like 0, 1, 2, but also negative numbers, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, etc but with a restriction. Right? You can only, uh, you can only uh, represent the following range. You can only represent integers in the range. There we go. Now, that's 2.147 billion uh, and change <laughs> on the, the negative side, 2.147 billion and change on the positive side. 
The reason for this being is computers are finite objects. Integers are an infinite domain, right? We don't have enough data in the universe to represent every single possible number. Right? Uh, on a computer, typically, you only have 32 bits. So 32 bits, right? One of them is going to be the sign bit. Zero for positive, one for negative. The remaining 31 bits, because it's all bits, zeros and ones, you can represent two to the 31st or uh, in, uh, positive or negative, but of course you have to start at zero. That's why it's, it doesn't match at the end. On the, uh, because you start at zero, you end at blah, 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 47 on one end, and you end at blah, 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 48 on the other end. Okay? It's a 32-bit signed twos complement integer for anybody who's done some lower level stuff. Okay? You also have doubles, right? which are floating point numbers, floating point numbers that can represent any uh, fractional value with about 16 digits of accuracy. And that's because, again, it is limited. You have 64 bits in this case. One of those bits is for the sign bit. A certain number of those bits are for the mantissa. And a certain number of those bits are for the exponent. Or that's actually exponent and then mantissa. What the hell am I talking about? Well, let's write some traditional math here. Right? So uh, 16 to 17. It depends. Right? 16 to 17. Right? Somewhere in there, right? Uh, you, you might get lucky and you know represent more. Uh, you might get unlucky. You might, you might get unlucky with a particular number and only get 15 digits of accuracy. It's thereabouts, right? So 3.14 times 10 to the I don't know third. There we go. What value is that? 3.14e. Three, you've seen that form too, maybe? Or capital E? Or if I were to write it out without any fancy scientific notation, right, that's what this is, what would it be? 3,140, 3, is that right? Yep, why? Times 10 to the third, it's base 10 because we're all humans and we count in base 10, right? And so what do you do? You move the decimal over, right? If I wanted to represent, say, something very small, negative three, where, what would it be then? The other way, right? Something like that. Let me restore that. Scientific notation is how a computer represents floating point numbers as well. This thing right here is the mantissa, 3.14. That's where you get your 17 digits of accuracy, 16, 17 digits of accuracy. This thing up here is the exponent. And then out here, there's implicitly a, a sign bit here that's plus or minus, right? And so you only have a certain number of bits for each one of these three things. And because of that, you have a very limited scope of what you can represent, about 16 digits of accuracy. You can't even represent something like one third. It's going to be 0.3333333, then you're gonna run out of accuracy, and then it's gonna go two or four, right? And guess as to the rest of the digits. Uh, this is all because computers are finite objects. You can bring in a library if you want. If you need more sig figs, right, then you can bring in a library to do it for you. Right? And there are plenty of libraries out there. Some languages support what's called uh, uh, multi-precision natively. For example, if anybody has any Python experience, uh, as of Python 3 something, uh, they have multi-precision support. So if you, uh, if, if you can uh, represent as, many, uh, as big a numbers as you want. Uh, it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of doing all that, that number crunching in software instead of hardware. And hardware is orders of magnitude faster. Right? And software is orders of magnitude slower. Right? All right, but that's why you have a limited number of digits. We're not going to get into it with, uh, too, uh, too, uh, in too much more detail than that. If you want to, then there's this huge document called the IEEE 754 Floating Point uh, Reference Manual of some, some sort. You can read 50 different pages of what happens when you add these two floating point numbers together. How does it represent this floating point number? How does it represent one third, et cetera, et cetera? Right. Don't worry about it. The takeaway is with a double, you only have about 16 to 17 digits of accuracy. 
you can represent huge giant numbers. It's just that you can only get the first 17 digits accurate and the rest of them are all going to be garbage or zero. Right? Okay. And then finally, you have char. Right? This is a single uh, character value from the ASCII text table. Right? So what is the ASCII text table? Way back, even before modern computers, they codified the, uh, this is too big, reset that, yeah, that's good enough, there we go. Way back, I believe, uh, who came after FDR, Truman? I think in the Truman administration, they came up with the idea that we need to codify and solidify what uh, the American uh, character set, A through Z, lowercase, uppercase, numbers zero through nine, most of the punctuation. And for their model, they just took the standard QWERTY keyboard, uh, of which they were typewriters at the time. They put them all up into a list, and they organized it so that everything had a unique number. For example, where is uh, capital A here, is represented by decimal 65. Right? Lowercase a is represented by decimal 79. You have some unprintable lower end numbers, uh, lower end uh, characters, for example, the null terminating character, we'll talk about that later. Uh, how do you go to the next line? I think that's 32, isn't it? No, 32 is space. Uh, what is the next line? Uh, 12? Uh, no, 10 it looks like is the line feed. Tab is nine, right? And then there are some, some that make a ding on a, uh, uh, if, you, if you printed it out, it would, make, it would make your console ding or something like that. Now, again, think about this is like 70 years ago that they put this together. That's why it's called the American Standard Code for Information Exchange. Because you know, not back in 1950, not, they, they were working on their own stuff. Of course, now, nowadays we have need for CJK fonts, Chinese, Japanese, Korean fonts. Uh, we have need for, even back then, you needed to extend this because you needed to say things like umlauts and diacritics over your O's that were used in other languages. So they extended it past 127, 0 to 127 for the standard Ameri ASCII set, and then 128 through 255 for the extended ASCII character set. And as we've gone on, we've had more and more things to put in. For example, ancient Egyptian. It, there is a, you can type in ancient uh, uh, Egyptian. Uh, they, they, they tried to get Klingon in there, but it was rejected because it was deemed not a real language. Right? Uh, so uh, this is all, you, and, but for some reason, they allowed emojis, right? Emoji table, right? This is all part of the, uh, not, okay, <laughs> I'm getting the tables there. You, I should have put in Unicode, not an actual physical table. Uh, but the full emoji list here, it's all part of a standard called Unicode. Unicode defines millions and millions of more characters that are available. All right, I don't know why it's taking so long, but whatever. All right. Anyway, you've seen the smileys that you can put, the, the poop emoji and stuff like that. Uh, it has some value that's way, way bigger in the millions uh, instead. All right. Uh, and we've ex uh, the, the Unicode standard currently has up to eight by, uh, up to four bytes, I believe. Uh, and so we're, we're set for many, many millions of more uh, uh, characters uh, to, to create and to uh, adopt into the Unicode standard. Right? Uh, in fact, uh, there was an article that I posted in a previous version of this class of this guy that wanted to go in and uh, he, he actually drafted a proposal to add a half star into the, uh, the, the star, the empty star and then the filled star were already part of the Unicode standard. Uh, he documented how, what he had to go through in order to, to write a proposal, put it up to the standards committee, and say, we need a star that's half filled. Why? Because in a rating system, you want three and a half stars instead of just three or four stars. And so he documented the process of, every, of the, uh, what it takes to get something like that standardized. And it took him years uh, uh, to do so, I think. Uh, but in any case, you can write your own proposal if you want. Uh, if you want a half filled poop emoji or something, uh, then you can go ahead and write the standard and maybe it'll get adopted by the, uh, the Unicode folks. Right? But in any case, we are restricted in C to a single ASCII character text uh, value. Right? That's one byte, that's eight bits, and so that you can only represent zero up to uh, 255 and 
so you can represent anything on these two tables. Okay. All right. There are others. Look them up. All right. Uh, we're not going to get into them. You might be thinking about float. All right. There is a float value. A float is just a, uh, a neuter double. You only get 32 bits of accuracy, and so you only get about six digits of accuracy instead. Uh, there's, uh, at least in this course, there will be no, uh, no need to use them. Okay? So these are the three that we're going to start out with, and then later on we'll add to this list. All right? So names. Right? Uh, generally, generally, you should, generally, you should use... Uh, whoa, what time, what time do we go to? Oh yeah, two, 2.45, right? We're on 1.30, okay, we're good. Uh, generally, you should use uh, the lower camel casing convention, All right? Uh, you cannot use lower, uh, you cannot use white space in variable names. Uh, you can use digits, say zero through nine, but shouldn't and cannot begin a variable name with a digit. Uh, you can use underscores if you like, but shouldn't, right? Uh, and just go with that first bullet there. Generally, you should prefer the lower camel casing convention. Why do we call it lower camel casing? If your variable is multiple words, well, first of all, if your variable is a single word, right, it should be all lowercase. If a single word, use all lowercase, right? If multiple words, multiple words, then the first one is all lowercase, and each the and the first letter of each subsequent word is capitalized. Now, why do we use that convention? Well, write it out. What if I didn't use lower camel casing? What if I did lower camel casing, right? Which one is easier to read? The one where you've got some capital letters in there delimiting each one of those words or the one where it's all lowercase? Uh, the first one, right? Well, you could also use underscore casing, lower underscore casing, lower underscore casing. And this is actually very common uh, and it's okay to use that. But the problem is that, if, one, it's really old school. Uh, two, what are you doing if you're typing a, an underscore every single time that you won't need to delimit a word? How do you type the underscore? Hold down the shift button, go all the way across the keyboard, and hit the hyphen to get the underscore, right? Save your pinky, right? It gets, it gets tiring after a while when you're always having to hold down the shift key every single word, right? And it slows you down because you're having to go across the keyboard, right? So don't use that. Instead, use it, we did use it, right, for, uh, for define, define macros or constants, use upper underscore casing. Right? So where did I use that before? Pounds per kilogram, right? Then then you can use that, that because it's different. Is that a variable? What is, what is a variable? What does a variable mean? It can change. It can vary, right? When I define a constant like this, is the number of pounds per kilogram ever going to change, at least on this planet? No. So if it's not going to change and you treat it as a constant, it's not a variable because it can't vary. Pi is a variable. It can't vary. You can't change, or you shouldn't change it, right? So use a different uh, convention for that kind of stuff. Okay. And in general, oops, in general, name variables for what they stand for. Not mysterious, mysterious names, right? For example, bad variable names. X, right? Unless you are doing just like X, Y coordinates, in which case, well, what does X stand for? Well, it stands for the X-axis, right? Has anybody ever had another name for the X-axis? Like, if you have actual data that you are plotting, right? Time and effort or something like that. 
then you would name the variable, the x-axis time, you name the y-axis uh, whatever you're, you're modeling. But in general, if you're just talking about the Euclidean plane, the xy plane, has anybody ever called it anything other than x? All right. So if you are using xy coordinates and say computing the distance from one point to another point, x1, y1, x2, y2, those are perfectly fine. But if you're using x, say, to stand for the number of students in this class, bad variable name, right? Or placeholder variable names like foo, or really terrible variable, right? Or variable one. And by the way, I need another variable now, variable two, right? You see this all the time, right? It's terrible, terrible practice. Why? You declare it up here as variable one. You come down here and it's variable, wait, what, what the hell was variable one again, right? 100 lines of code away, you're going up and down every single time to find out what your variables stood for. Whereas if you had just named it, say, number of students, right? Say, no, uh, good number of students, right? Or pounds, or kilograms, right? Those are all completely self-documenting. And remember, code should be self-documenting, okay? Uh, all right. So that's good. Let's get back to our actual writing the program now. Uh, actually, before we do that, now that we have our three variable, uh, variable types here, so placeholders in printf, in printf, and scanf. Right? So to print a, an integer, use percent %d. There we go. Uh, to to read or print an integer, to read a double, use percent %lf. To print a double, use percent %f. Right. So, unfortunately, they don't always stand what they. Uh, uh, they don't always use the same one that they stand for. For example, if you were to print an, uh, an integer. I would, I would have thought that the placeholder would be an I, right? I for integer. No, it's D for decimal. <laughs> well, wait, double, double should be D, right? No, it's not. Double is F or LF, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're using printf to print a double, then it would be percent %f. If you're using it to read a double, then it would be percent %lf. Right? F stands for floating point number. LF stands for long floating point number. Floating point number would only be 32 bits. Uh, floating, uh, a uh, long float would be 64 bits. And that's why we call it, make that distinction. Right? And then finally, to read or print a character, char, right? use, this is the only one that makes sense. And so if it makes sense, it should be a percent %c. There we go. Okay. So let's go back over here and use this knowledge now. So I've declared my variables, right? I'm going to read my variable into kilograms. Remember, foo is a bad placeholder, but that's a bad variable name. Now here's something I didn't cover yet, and I won't cover until later. What the hell is that ampersand in front of it? I don't know. We'll get into that when we get into pointers and memory. That is the referencing operator. But basically, here's a preview. What it's doing is it's giving you the memory address of where that variable is stored in the computer instead of the variable itself. That's so that it can pass the memory address to the function and it can do its job. Again, just a preview, don't worry about the details for now. Just understand that if you forget the ampersand, bad things will happen, but the compiler will let you know. So let me save this and try to compile it. What did we compile it as again, you remember? What is our compiler called? GCC, All right? and this is convert, there we go. And it gave me a warning here. Wait, LF uh, and this, wait, did you, it's not gonna say explicitly, did you forget the ampersand? Uh, it's just going to give you this error message that, uh, there, uh, that you, you treated it as, as a double, a, a regular old variable, and it expected a double star, right? That should be, again, it's not gonna be very descriptive because it assumes that you know what you're doing, uh, but that should be your, indication that I forgot the ampersand, okay? Just for now, remember, scanf, ampersand, scanf, ampersand, scanf, ampersand, 
Okay? Just say it over, over and over again until you get it. Right? Okay. After that line, the user has inputted, in fact, here, I'll show you that it's fixed now. If I compile again, no error message now because I put the ampersand there. Right? No news is good news. So let's go ahead and run it now, a.out. Right? There it is asking me nicely to put in kilograms. I'll go ahead and put in 10 kilograms. Right? And I hit enter. Right? And it didn't do anything. Why? Well, because it just read the input and then it, it was done. We didn't actually do these two steps here. But notice the behavior. It sits there and pauses and waits. It waits, it waits for me to type something in and then hit enter. What would happen if I don't enter anything in? What if I just hit enter right now? What have I entered? Nothing. What's the numerical value of nothing? Zero. So it's going to end up, well, uh, oh, it's actually going to, it, well, it, all right, I'm going to have to kill it now. But uh, it, should, uh, it should have at least, uh, okay, so let's do this again. Um, what if I did this, T-E-N? Is that a number? Yeah, well, yeah, it is. But is it a number that a computer is going to understand? No. So when I enter this, what's the numerical value of something you don't understand? It's going to be zero. And to prove that, let's print it out, just as a, a step here, let's print it back out to the user. Print up, you entered blah, blah, blah. Oh. Blah. What is that hyphen, or what is that backslash n again? Goes to the new line, right? And I'm going to print the kilograms back to them. Right? Scanf ampersand, printf, no ampersand. Right? Scanf ampersand, printf, no ampersand. Now this blah here, I want to put in the placeholder. This is a double, so what's the placeholder for a double again? Percent F, when you want to print it. What that's going to do is it's going to take the value in that variable, format it in base 10, because that, it's intended for humans now, and then it's going to replace that percent F with whatever was stored in that uh, variable. Is there a question? It won't do anything bad, but some, some, uh, some systems may not like it. I think that, that we're on an Ubuntu instance here, and so it's probably going to be okay with it. Let's find out. Yep. The compiler was okay with it, 10.5. There, 10.5. So if you want to, you can go ahead and, uh, at least for this course, because I think CSE will be okay with it too. Uh, it's what? It's a, yeah, it's, it's going to be a memory issue, yeah, exactly. In fact, I think it ha might have no effect, or if the compiler does complain, it'll probably just complain that it, it doesn't want to do that or something. All right. Yeah, way back there. So will something like that change from different It could, yes. Right? In fact, lots of stuff can, cha can change from compiler to compiler. C is a very... Uh, the standard for C the, the, like, are very loose, right? If C doesn't say what the standard is, what should happen, then compiler writers are free to do whatever the hell they want. For example, what value is stored in kilograms as of line 19? Nothing. Nothing? Right. So nothing would be zero? That would be the sensible default. And 99 out of 100 compilers will do that. It's that 1% of compilers or 1% of situations where the compiler doesn't do that. And it just uses whatever was stored in the memory when it began. Right? I didn't want to clear out the memory and zero it all out. So I'll go ahead and use whatever is there. Other compilers might use a flag value to indicate that it was uninitialized memory. Uh, one trick to do that is to use dead beef. So uh, hex speak, right? you're limited to zero through nine and A, a B, C, D, E, F. What are, the words, what are the clever words that you can spell with that? You can spell dead beef, right? And so I'll go ahead and use those, that particular byte sequence to indicate that this is uninitialized mem memory. It's a big shrug. What's stored in there as of light 19? Anybody's guess. It depends on what the compiler writers were, uh, were how they were feeling that day, right? There was another question? Or was it resolved? Okay. Uh, reminds me I should be checking online too. No questions online. All right. So there is no default value. Other languages do, of course, have a default value. Usually it's zero, and that is specified by the language, but the C uh, specification doesn't say what a default should be. 
it leaves it up to whatever you want to do. <laughs> Question? Should we initialize it as early? You should. That, that's a good uh, practice to get into of initializing your variables. But if you're immediately going to go ahead and just overwrite it down here, it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's go back to this. And what if I am a keyboard masher instead? All right, what is it read now? Is that a new number that it can understand? No. Nope. So it says J. OK, I can't parse that. What have I parsed so far? Nothing. What is the numerical value of nothing? Zero. Uh, how do you prevent somebody from mashing the keyboard? You can't. Uh, I mean, there are. You, the, the, it goes beyond the first week of a C course, though. Uh, you can check that. Uh, you can check. Uh, did they enter in the correct input? No. All right. Reprompt them for the uh, the correct input until they give me something I can use. That would require zeroing out the buffer and getting rid of the standard input. That would require uh, using scanf to count up the number of tokens that were matched. A bunch of if statements and, and stuff like that, don't worry about it, OK? On the grader, we are always going to give you well-formatted input. We could give you bad input. For example, what is, uh, how, can you have a negative 6 kilograms? Well, you can read in a negative 6 kilograms. I mean, you can convert it to negative pounds. Does it make that much sense, though? Uh, I mean. Helium, helium does not have a negative mass, by the way, right? Uh, it's just going to be buoyant in an atmosphere, right? Uh, if you take it out into space, helium is still going to have the same mass that it had here on Earth, right? It's just going to be, uh, it's just, just going to stay where it is instead of floating up into the atmosphere. Uh, so there's no such thing as negative mass, right? So maybe that's something that we want to add to our program later on to ensure that we have good input, okay? All right, but I'll go ahead and get rid of this for now. I am confident that we are reading the input from the user properly. Right? Granted, they could be an ID10T user. ID10T user. Right? There's, that, there's that hex speak again, right? or that leet speak. Right? They could be a bad user and mash their keyboard. There's not much we can do about it at this point. Maybe later on we can. Uh, but let's go ahead and con uh, compute the conversion. How would you convert kilograms to pounds? Pounds, I will set that equal to however many kilograms you gave me times what? Pounds per kilogram. I'm going to go ahead and cut paste that there. Right. Now, there are two things going on here. First of them is the assignment operator. And the second of them is the multiplication operator. Now, let's focus on the multiplication operator first of all. If you were to write this out as math, in fact, let's go over here. Uh, in your math class, how would you write A times B? What are some options? A, A, just leaving it like that, right? Can you do that in code? Can you just mash two variable names together? Nope. It would interpret that as one variable, not an option. Uh, times, right. the cross. Do you see that on your QWERTY keyboard that is over 100 years old? Nope, not an option. Another one would be the center dot. Right? You've, you've seen these before, right? right? These conventions. Do you see that on your QWERTY keyboard? No, I see something that looks like it called a period. Oops, I'm sorry, this is LaTeX. Period. But is that a good idea? No, that just, that just takes the center dot and moves it down here. Right? So. What else on your QWERTY keyboard that's over 100 years old looks kind of like that multiplication symbol? The star, right? So that's the closest thing. So when they were developing computers and they inherited this QWERTY keyboard that was over 100 years old, even at the time, not maybe 100 years old, uh, but they were looking at it and say, OK, we don't have a multiplication here. I usually write that down by, uh, by hand. So what are we going to do? All right, well, this is the closest thing. Let's go for it. All right. Likewise. Other things, so operators first, operators. Right. So uh, we have math, uh, algebraic, I should say, operators. Right. We have multiplication, which is going to be times. What else do we have? We have addition, right. which is plus. Guess what? That is on your QWERTY keyboard. Right. We have subtraction 
which is going to be the hyphen, which is on your keyboard. Excellent. Uh, we have division, which is going to be, if you were to write this out, looks like that. Right? Or frac, uh, frac of A and B. There we go. Can you write that out in code, though? I'm writing that out in LaTeX, if, if you know LaTeX here. Uh, just to show you what the, the math looks like. All right, now let's translate that to the QWERTY, what we have available at our QWERTY keyboard here. A divided by B. Right? Now again, is that a backslash or a forward slash? Forward, forward slash, exactly. Right? So we've got those operators, and we've got the assignment operator. We'll have need to come back to the, the division here in a second. But we also have the assignment operator, operator, excuse me. And it is a single equals sign, right. equals. Right. It is not the algebra break, uh, left is equal, left hand side is equal to the right hand side, right? If I write A in algebra, if I write A is equal to B plus C, right? I'm making an assertion. The thing on the left-hand side is equal to the thing on the right-hand side. That is not what I'm doing in code. Right? We have something else to do that. We use the equals equals sign. Uh, but here, for better or worse, they decided that the single equal sign should be the assignment operator. It takes the value, expression, or other uh, variable from the right-hand side and places it into the variable on the left-hand side. Right. That's just the way it works, right? It takes the thing over here and puts it over here. So consequently, the thing on the left-hand side can only ever be a variable, right? If I tried to do something like this, restore this, right? If I got it mixed up and put the expression on the left-hand side and the variable that I want to put it into on the right-hand side, no go. The compiler doesn't know what to do with that at all. Like, what? Error. L value, the left-hand value, required a left operand of assignment. Right? So this, the thing on the left-hand side has to be a single variable. In fact, here we go. I'll do it like this. Is that going to compile? Why not? Pound versus pounds. Did you, that, you wrote pound. Did you mean pounds? Right? That's what the uh, compiler is asking right here. Okay, fine. I did mean pounds. Is that going to compile? Oops, sorry. Nope. nope. Why? It is case sensitive. Right? Exactly. Uh, you have to make sure that your spelling is correct uh, and consistent. You can get it misspelled, and as long as you're consistent, the compiler won't care. If I said, if I named the variable <laughs> pawns instead, and at least if I were as consistent about it, it would still be fine with it, right? Yeah, no news is good news. Uh, but don't do that, right? Check your spelling. There we go. Uh, the thing on the left-hand side has to be a variable. It has to be spelled correctly. And by the way, spelling means case sensitive. Uh, uppercase P pounds is not the same thing as lowercase P pounds. Okay. All right, and that takes this expression and places it over into the, left, the variable on the left-hand side. It could be a number, right? Actually, could it be this number? No, why? Too big. too big. And it knows that. Wait, integer constant is too large for its type, right? You can't just, you can't just have arbitrarily large numbers. 2.147 billion and change, and I don't know what the change was, but it'll be happy with this. But if I go even one more, oops. Uh, did I get my zeros wrong? Nope. Okay. I don't know why it's thinking that that's okay, but here we go. Try that. Oh, okay. Fine. I saved it, right? Anyway, uh, it's, it's probably thinking that it's maybe a long uh, integer or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but let's roll it all the way back here. There we go. There. It could be a complex expression. For example, if I had A plus B divided by C, Right? It could have, you could, you could mix all these things around. The problem comes with what, though? 
What if I tried to do something like this? If I've got, here's some more math. A plus B times C times C. Is that equal to A plus B times C? No, why? Order of operations. What is that called? Pem das, right? So C co coding follows follows PEMDAS rules. Does, that, does anybody not know that? Uh, what, what is it called? It's a, a mnemonic device, right? PEMDAS. Uh, it stands for something. What's the P stand for? Parentheses, if I can spell it right. Then what? Exponents. Multiplication, division, division, and then addition and then subtraction, All right? That's the order of operations. And I think I'm, oh, I'll, I'll correct my spellings later on. Uh, so with this expression down here, A plus B times C, what's the order of operations there? B times C is first because it has a higher order of precedence. Then it will add in the result, to add the re, uh, A to the result. Whereas if I change that and put parentheses around the addition, what happens? It gets elevated to the most, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the highest order of precedence. So all of your knowledge about PEMDAS, cut paste, and you're in the coding world. Okay, why? Because they wanted it to be familiar, right? They wanted it to be familiar to people who have used math before. Let's go ahead and finish out the pro uh, the finish out with a output here. Printf. Uh, that's. X pounds. Thank you for playing. Right? And I want to print, print out pounds. There we go. And this X here will be pounds. Uh, how did I print that out before with a placeholder? Percent. Remember, pounds is a double. So what's the placeholder for a double? F. F. Right. Let's run it one more, one t once at least. So if I have 10 kilograms, that should be 22 pounds. If I have 10.5, that should be around, what, 23 something? Yep, yay. Uh, if I have zero, all right, that's zero pounds. If I have negative one, oops, then that's gonna be negative 2.2 pounds, right? If I mash the keyboard again, oops, then I'm gonna get zero pounds likewise, right? So it's, it looks like it's working to me. What if I screwed up and instead said, I want everything to be kilograms? Please enter this stuff. Well, my placeholders now change. It's going to be a percent D. This placeholder changes to percent D. All right. Let's find out. And then I'll leave you with the question of why for next week. 10.5 kilograms. Actually, 10.9 kilograms. Right. That's 22 pounds. It gave me an answer. Is it the correct answer? No. What's going on here? It, oh, it, it's getting cut off, right? There's a technical name for that. It's called truncation, right? And when we come back on Monday, we'll, that's where we'll pick it up. Right? Otherwise, you've got your lab and your hack this Friday. The lab is due at midnight on Friday. The hack is due on Tuesday, midnight Tuesday next week. The hack has you working on uh, GitHub, uh, so you will need a partner for it. So make sure that you're hooking up with at least one other person uh, for at least for that part, okay?